Hello, I'm Erica from the British Society for Immunology. Over the last 12 months, we've been supporting the UK Coronavirus Immunology Consortium, which is a UK-wide research effort to better understand how the immune system responds to SARS-CoV-2 as well as COVID-19 vaccinations. Today, I'm joined by Professor Alex Richter from the University of Birmingham to answer your questions. Welcome, Alex, and thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Erica. Uh, thank you for having me today. Question number one. When you get COVID, where exactly in your body does the immune response happen? So we know that SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory virus. So it enters the body either through the nose or through the mouth. So the first um, immune response is a mucosal response. So this is the lining of the nose and the mouth. And we trigger the innate or the pre-programmed first line of defense immune system. And that tries to tackle the, the, the virus, but it then also triggers for the more um, specific adaptive parts of the immune response to be triggered. And that is when the whole body's immune system becomes involved. Question number two, does my immune system react differently to different variants? This is something we're still trying to work out. Um, certainly the innate immune response is very similar between viruses and will be very similar between variants. So I think what this question is really getting at is how good is cross protection against different variants? The adaptive or this you know, memory immune response is highly specific. And so a variant may mean that the body's immune system no longer recognizes that variant as being a similar type of, um, of virus. Question number three, why can't I just rely on my immune system to fight off the virus? Doesn't it do that with other viruses? Well, it depends on the virus. Um, some viruses that cause a mild disease like the common cold can be fought off by the immune system with very little um, damage to health, either in the short term or in the long term. But for some viruses, they can't be cleared by the immune system, like HIV, or some viruses cause such severe disease and death, like Ebola, that we really do need preventative measures. Now, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, that causes COVID-19, um, this virus is probably somewhere in the middle of that risk scale. Um, we have no natural infection as mankind against this virus because we've never been exposed to it before. And we've got no doubt that over the last 18 months that social distancing and vaccination is saving lives. Question number four, do we know why children don't seem to get as sick with COVID-19? We still fully don't know the answers to this question, but the, you know there are a number of theories. Um, Certainly as children, when we're very young, we have very many more infections because our immune system isn't yet trained and doesn't yet have immune memory. And one of the theories is, is because children get so many colds and one of the um, viruses that cause colds is a coronavirus, that there, this may be affording some cross protection to children. Data coming out of the States is suggesting that more children are being admitted uh, with the Delta variant than they were with potentially previous variants. So we cannot always assume that children are going to have a mild disease. Question number five, if I'm vaccinated, how much time is needed for my immune cells to wake up if I get infected? The immune system is primed and ready to go for any infection that it has previously been exposed to. It takes about four to six weeks to fully generate that immune response. Um, just presenting um, a virus to the immune system to orchestrate this, the, the, this complex immune response which clears the virus takes that amount of time. But on the second exposure, because you've got these highly specific cells recognizing the virus, presenting it straight to the immune system, you get waking up of the immune response within days. Question number six, 
I've had both doses, but COVID antibody test was negative. Do I not have protection against COVID? It depends which antibody test you've had done. I would want to make sure that this test was done by a reputable laboratory with a reputable test that has a good sensitivity. Now, a number of patients, including the patients I look after who don't have um, very good immune systems, haven't made a response to the vaccine. And the way that we've measured that response is the traditional way is looking for antibodies. Um, now, antibodies are only part of the immune response. And so what we're doing in a number of research studies is not just looking for the antibody response, but also looking for the T cell response. And it can be that some patients don't produce a good, an antibody response, but they may produce a T cell response. Now, if you haven't produced antibodies, it doesn't mean that you have no protection because there are parts of the immune system that we don't measure, which may have gained some benefit from exposure to the vaccination. Question number eight. If you're taking immunosuppressants, can you tell if the vaccine worked? So we can use standard tests for this. And the standard test is an antibody test. Um, it is important to have a good quality antibody test. Now, in the research setting, we also measure other parts of the immune response. Um, T cells um, are a good example of that. We don't routinely measure T cell responses because in healthy individuals, your antibody response and your T cell response is usually fairly equivalent and they kind of go up together. Um, the T cell tests are much more challenging to do in a laboratory and there is more variation with them. So as for lots of other diseases like uh, measles, mumps and rubella, we tend to measure immune memory by antibody responses. Question number nine, what's the most important thing you've learned about COVID? The first thing is not to underestimate this virus. It is a significant challenge to global health and it is going to be with us for a number of years to come. And I think on the back of that, there is no one solution for dealing with this. Um, as we're seeing um, over the summer and autumn months, uh, as cases rise despite prior double vaccination, we need a number of different st strategies all working in parallel together to try and tackle this virus and to get back to some kind of normality. And the final question, question number 10, what questions are still left unanswered about COVID? We're only 18 months into a pandemic and this is the first time we've seen this virus. So whilst we've had unprecedented scientific advancement, you know, to produce a vaccine within a year, to learn as much as we have about this virus within a year. There is still so much that we don't know. I think some of the key things that I uh, would like to question and get answered at the moment is how long will the immunity from vaccines last? You know, when are we going to need booster vaccines and who should we boost? I guess the next point is how frequently will the virus continue to mutate and how our existing immunity from previous infections and vaccinations protect us against not just the Delta variant, but future variants. And then my last key thought is about long COVID. And I think long COVID by itself is not one condition. I think that the virus is having a number of different impacts on, um, on the body um, with varying severity. And understanding long COVID is the first step in understanding how we should treat long COVID. Thank you so much, Alex. Those were brilliant answers. And thank you everyone for submitting your questions. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Alex. Goodbye. Thank you to the BSI and the UKCIC for this opportunity to answer questions about the immune system and COVID. And thank you to everybody that's taken part and posted questions. I hope some of these are useful to you.